thank you uh, to each of you for joining us today. Uh, and to those of you watching on Facebook Live on the TMDSES page, the Texas Health Education Service page, and on the Texas JAM page. My name is Enrique Hasso. I'm the Associate Director of the Texas Health Education Service located in the TMDSES office here in Austin, Texas. And we've got a fantastic panel joining us today as part of our second night uh, of the partnership that we have with the Tour for Diversity in Medicine group. So thank you very much to each of you uh, for joining us today. We're gonna get some great information uh, out about everybody's experience for being a, a physician or doctor here in Texas. Uh, so if you have any questions that do come up uh, for this panel, I'll be kind of hanging out in the background uh, and forwarding you questions to this panel. But for now, I'll leave it to Dr. Lander, who will be moderating this evening. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Enrique, for hosting us and uh, bringing us on. We are excited about this partnership and a chance to talk all things Texas. Um, we have an amazing uh, panel of individuals who are going to be joining us for the next hour, hopefully to answer as many questions uh, as possible. Um, you know, the Tour for Diversity uh, is excited about this partnership. We actually did one of our uh, tours in the state of Texas. Uh, it was our third tour. We uh, went all the way across the great state of Texas, starting in El Paso, uh, working our way to San Antonio, going down to the valley, uh, and then finishing up right around uh, the Houston area. Um, we have a lot of members uh, of our organization that have ties to Texas, either because of their clinical training or their medical school training, or they're from Texas. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we love to represent Texas. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my PVAMU gear because I'm a, a proud graduate of Prairie View A&M University and a son of Texas. Um, but I think what I want to do first is just go around and have our amazing panelists introduce themselves. Um, and then the first question I'll ask you uh, is tell us about your Texas ties. And I'll go with you first, uh, Dr. Romero. Uh, tell us who you are, what you do, and what are your Texas ties? Hey, it's great to see everyone. Um, uh, Dr. Minerva Romero Arenas. I'm a general and endocrine surgeon. I actually am from Mexico City originally, but I grew up in Houston, in Southwest Houston. Um, in, uh, and I went to the schools in the A-Leaf Texas um, school system. So from the SWAT. Um, I grew up in uh, Houston. I lived in a few places in the Southwest. And I did some of my training in Baltimore. Uh, I did a fellowship in endocrine surgery at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is part of, um, which is actually the number one cancer center in the world. And I worked down in Rio Grande Valley at the University of Texas for a few years. I have recently just moved actually, and I'm now um, establishing my practice in uh, New York City. All right, I love it. Got that SWAT representing Southwest uh, A Leaf. Go ahead. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Romero. I, next, I want to go to you, Dr. Cruz. Tell us about yourself. Tell us, you, you know, your your story. What do you do, and what are your Texas ties? So, good evening. Uh, my name is Jose Cruz. I am uh, from South Texas. I am from uh, the Rio Grande Valley. I went to school up in the Northeast. I did my medical school um, in um, University of North Texas, TCOM. Um, I further went to residency in Oklahoma, um, did med peds, and then did a subspecialty training that I'm completing now in Louisiana. Um, and I'm scheduled to go back and be a full-time hematologist and oncologist in the Rio Grande Valley back in my hometown starting sometime in the summer. Hey, congratulations, my man. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Henry, hey, tell us on, your name, uh -huh. uh, what you do, a little bit about yourself and your ties to Texas. All right, uh, hey, what's going on, y'all? Uh, my name is Brandon Henry. Uh, I am a sports medicine doc, uh, currently out in Riverside, California. Um, I... I'm from LA, but I did my medical school at the Mecca Howard University uh, in Washington, D.C., and then uh, came back to Cali, did a PEDS residency there, and then my ties to Texas would be where I did fellowship. Um, I did my fellowship um, um, at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where I was uh, on medical staff for their athletics 
uh, Sikkim Bears. And then I felt like I would go ahead and, and wear this for y'all. This is my, uh, uh, if I can get it off, this is my Big 12 championship ring for when our, our women's soccer team uh, won the uh, won the Big 12. There's my name there in the Baylor Bears. So I feel like I go ahead and just do that while we're here. So. All right. Thank you for representing. And as I mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Alden Landry. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I'm originally from Texas. I was born in Baytown, Texas. Uh, I was an army brat, so we moved all around the country, but home has always been Texas. Uh, and, um, you know, all my family is right there uh, in Northeast Houston or uh, in Liberty County, uh, just outside of Houston. And I uh, ended up going to undergrad at Prairie View A&M University, uh, right outside of uh, Houston. Best decision of my life, really shaped me as uh, the individual who I've grown up to become. Ended up leaving for medical school and I've been up here in Boston at Harvard Medical School, serving as the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership for the past few years. Uh, I also helped to uh, co-found and co-direct the Tour for Diversity in Medicine with Dr. Cameron Matthews, who was with us uh, yesterday evening. Um, but I'll say this, it's, uh, you know, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be talking to fellow Texans uh, and it's an honor to talk about Texas uh, in medicine. Um, but I think first things first, one of the things I wanna unpack um, is um, something that's very germane to what's happening with us uh, across our entire country, but it's particularly hitting our uh, Texas uh, hard, and that's COVID-19. Um, and so I want to uh, just have a brief discussion with you, you all about what are your experiences, not necessarily related to um, practicing in Texas, but how has COVID-19 impacted you as a physician? And so uh, maybe I'll go to you first, uh, Dr. Henry, because I remember you telling me stories about your experience uh, in the COVID line um, uh, with cars driving up and you having to do those swabs. So why don't you tell us about your experience as a doctor during this COVID era? Yeah, so, you know, it's um, as a sports medicine doc, right, as soon as the pandemic hit and realist, like, re realistically, as soon as Rudy Gobert came down and he was the first athlete that came positive uh, with the virus, uh, sports really just kind of shut down from there. So I didn't really have uh, much work to do as a physician. And so, you know, like Dr. Landry and then a bunch of our, our other um, docs that are on the tour or like in emergency medicine or in the ICU. And so I felt like I had a lot of close friends that were, when they say frontline, that are really in front of this thing. And so I felt it was um, a call to duty for me to somehow get outside and, and be in front of people who were suffering. And so what I decided to do was um, I took it upon myself to really kind of be the only physician that was doing the COVID testing. And so we had our drive through lines and um, it was amazing being out there because it was just crazy how it just, it kind of started and you have a couple of cars that were coming in to get tested. And then all of a sudden those couple of cars became like 50 and then all of a sudden it became a hundred, then all of a sudden it became a couple hundred. And as you're seeing people in the line to get tested, the look, um, of fear in a sense of just being scared um, on their faces and just trying to talk to them. And, or I had one guy that he was so sick that he was driving and we would kept telling him to pull forward. And every single time he would stop, he would almost like, it was almost like he dang near passed out at every single time he was stopping. It was hard trying to keep him with it, right? So where we could even test him. So it was just crazy to, to see how sick people were and then when you hear everybody kind of saying, oh, it's not real, it's not true, but you're seeing how sick people are right there in front of you and you're trying to tell them it's okay, it's okay, you know, hey, we'll get through this, you know, and just trying to comfort them. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty scary at first. It was definitely, definitely scary. I mean, it still is, but it, it was just something we had never seen before. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a really tough time for a lot of us. Dr. Cruz, what have, it, uh, have been your experience as a hemog doc dealing with uh, COVID-19? So the hardest part of dealing with COVID-19 has been from a patient perspective. I, I see the repercussions from a patient perspective. Um, COVID has impacted the way that we operate on, a, on the outpatient basis, meaning in the clinic. And so one of the things, the nature of HEMOC is, or the, of oncology is you're dealing with cancer. And so for the most part, those are not pleasant news that somebody wishes to hear. And a lot of our patients require emotional support. They require to have somebody there for, for support, for strength as, as, as kind of a cheerleader. 
And so one of the ways it, it, that um, COVID has impacted the way that all clinics operate is that um, family members are no longer allowed to come into the patient's room unless they, um, they have to provide or they're for, for some sort of physical assistance. And, and so the hardest part for me has been having to break news to patients and there being nobody there to support them. You know, the, we, we tend to forget that, you know, nowadays, you know, COVID has really impacted um, not only um, the way that we operate, but also our ability. I think it has, it, it has impacted our ability to sympathize with patients. Like before, let, let me just give you an example. Before when a patient would, would cry, you, for the most part, you, you were one of the easiest ways to ease or, or to help the patient know that you sympathize with them is maybe a tap on the shoulder or a tap on the knee. And you can't do that anymore. And so um, just not being able to be there emotionally for the patient, it's pretty tough. And, and, and I feel that, that that is one of the things that that is hard to work work through, um, especially since, you know, the kind of patient population that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis requires that emotional support. And the fact that you're not being, that, that, that you're not even able to take care of the most basic instinct is it, just like very, dis I, I feel very disheartened as a physician that I'm not able to be there in that, in that emotional way. And, and it's tough. It's, it's just been heart uh, breaking. Um, for me, not being able to be there for my patients in that way. I have to agree with you 100%. You know, a, a human touch goes a long way. And it's one thing that uh, has essentially been eliminated from medicine, you know, um, you know, whether it's the handshake when you greet the patient when you walk into the room, uh, or the, the touch on the shoulder when you break bad news. So it's been it's been amazingly difficult as as we try and continue to maintain that humanist, humanistic side of medicine. Um, in addition to uh, just the art and science of, uh, of practicing. Um, uh, Minerva, Dr. Romero, I wanna to turn to you. What are your thoughts about this? What, how has, how has COVID-19 impacted your practice as a, as a surgeon? Yeah, so, you know, I, um, I was not, I did not have, uh, like you, Dr. Landry, I did not have the um, ability to stay home from work. Uh, there are many conditions in general surgery that were still considered essential and life-saving interventions. And so um, similarly to um, Dr. Henry, my elective practice really shut down. And there were several months when, you know, we essentially had recommendations to not do anything that was not truly considered life-saving. In that regard, I also felt like I um, should volunteer. And so, I, you know, I, I volunteered for taking as many of the general um, surgery call days as was reasonable. Um, I saw a lot of patients who were hesitant to come to the emergency room because, of course, they were getting warnings to avoid um, hospitals at all costs. And unfortunately, that also translated to many people coming in with more advanced disease so maybe an appendicitis that you could have caught early was actually um, ruptured and, and caused a more severe infection than, um, than we would routinely see. And, and the same thing for other conditions like hernias, um, gallbladder surgery. And unfortunately, we also saw a similar impact in patients who had cancer where uh, some of the cancer care was unfortunately delayed. Um, some of the patients didn't feel comfortable um, having their surgery. And it was a little bit hard to really provide a lot of guidance in terms of when is it appropriate to proceed with an intervention? When is it appropriate to wait it out? You know, initially we thought it's okay to wait it out a few weeks uh, because we weren't sure how long it, um, this, you know, um, disease was going to happen. But when it became evident that we were really talking about years, um, you know, months, maybe years, everybody, th you know, thankfully that our societies revised um, their stance, at least the initial stance, and we were able to proceed with, um, with other surgeries. You know, and, and just to, to add on what you were saying, uh, Dr. Romero, um, 
you know, when, when COVID, that first wave hit back in March, April, we had no clue what was going on. Um, and it was a very dark place for physicians. And, you know, we're, we're as a uh, understanding of disease, obviously in a better position, um, but that doesn't make the disease any less deadly, nor does it make it any less scary for us to walk into the hospital. Um, and I just want to say, um, you know, as a physician, talking to physicians, thank you for what you do. Um, thank you for continuing to care for patients. Um, we obviously have a tough job. We chose this profession. And for many of us, it's been career affirmation, um, understanding that, you know, even despite how bad things are, we're still going to go into work and still going to do our job. Uh, so thank you all for sharing your stories. I want to switch it up a little bit now. Um, you know, we got Texas ties. Um, you know, when you think of Texas, uh, what do you think about? So uh, Minerva, what is your, what is your, what is your thoughts of Texas? When you think of Texas, I'll tell you mine first. When I think of Texas is barbecue. Um, I'm all about the barbecue. I got my barbecue smoker in the back. Uh, you can't tell me nothing about my brisket. I know it goes hard. Um, but when you think about Texas, Minerva, what do you, uh, Dr. Romero, what do you think about? What do you, what, what's home for you? So I'll tell you, uh, one of the things that shocked me the most up here, um, has been ordering tacos. Now, <laughs> There's, there's not much more Texan or American than Mexican food, right? And uh, tacos definitely, when I, the first time I ordered tacos here and they told me it was $6, <laughs> my first question was, how many come in that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what. You know what you can't get? You can't get breakfast tacos anywhere. And like, you know, I, I when, every time I go back home, um, you know, if I'm not at Shipley's, I'm getting some breakfast tacos. And I, they don't, they don't know about the culture of breakfast tacos up here. So, well, the good thing is I know how to cook, and so I, I have yet to go hungry. But go. it's definitely um, something that you know is needed when you're in a pinch for time. Yeah. Now, Dr. Henry, you're uh, Brandon. You're an adopted son of Texas. You know, yeah, you got yeah. your, you got your Texas ties. Right. Um, but what do you think of when you think of Texas? So I'm gonna go ahead. So real quick, I'm, I'm gonna go two parts. One with uh, 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 Dr. Romero was saying. So I still think Cali, we we still got, you have to throw us in there when we talk about Mexican food. So I just want to make it, make it clear. I mean, again, I, I am an adopted son of Texas and I love Texas personally. That that time in Texas was probably by far one of the best times I, I of my life. But anyways, first thing I think about when it comes to Texas outside of food um, is how crazy the high school football stadiums are in Texas. Um, Every single time I talk to people, right, because of being in sports, and I tell people all the time, I say the three states that have by far probably the most, the best athletes in the country would be Cali, Texas, and Florida. That's typically, those three states are unmatched for the most part. But when you look at stadiums in Texas, I, I mean, I just, like Allen, Texas, Allen High School, their stadium, uh, $60 million for their stadium. And we're talking just one high school, just for them alone. Um, Ball is life, definitely in Texas. Man. And and it, it's it's just it's crazy. I mean, in Waco, Waco ISD, um, their combined stadium for the two high schools was 13 million, and they've got press boxes, elevators that go up into the press box. Like, I always believed that when people talked about sports in Texas, and and you know, again, being being from LA, it's like, oh, okay, cool, right? I know they're they're big, but I have got to say that sports in Texas. It, and it's not just about just football. It, it's just sports in general. And the way that towns take the sports, the way that things literally do shut down on Friday nights and, and for these games, um, for me was memories that, that I will never forget and just seeing the way that those things go. So uh, loved it. I mean, just along those lines, Dr. Henry, um, going to Texas Relays, um, you know, and going to UT Austin and watching the, the track races. I mean, you've got the pros running with high school students and I mean, right. it's just a phenomenal experience. So, so real quick, when you talk about the sports, right? Cause that Baylor has a prolific, uh, track, track and field team, especially when you talk about like the 400 meters and we got people that are Olympians. And so the meet that we had there, it was Baylor, it was Texas tech. It was university of Texas. Um, I think Arkansas was there. Uh, I mean, it was just phenomenal to see these athletes and and to see how excited everybody got for it. Again, it's it was one of a kind. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Cruz? Um, you know, you're not too far away from Texas right now. You're going to be going back pretty soon. 
Um, but what do you think about when you think of Texas? You, you know, I echo what everyone said, especially about the food. It's tough. It's tough not to think about the food. But first and foremost, like it's it's family and diversity. I mean, I've been very um, blessed to have lived in various parts of Texas. Um, but I'll have to say that there there is no two places in Texas are really alike. If you compare the Rio Grande Valley, you know, to where I did med school in Fort Worth, they're not the same. And if you compare um, the uh, Fort Worth um, communities and like kind of culture, it's not the same as Austin. So there, there's a lot of diversity even within even within Texas. And so like I just miss my own, my I miss my hometown. And one of the things is is that it's tough to explain to people my hometown because um you know the Rio Grande Valley in and of itself it's almost like a, a place unique of its own. It has its own culture, but but then all kind of communities in Texas have their own little like culture. And they're all kind of like unique, but they're all unified in this sense of like, we're Texans, you know, like, and so, um, but, but, but they're all different. And, you know, with, when it comes to me and I think of Texas, I think about my hometown. I think about my family. I think about the food. I think about the cheap food, you know, have to have to emphasize the cheap part um, and, and, and just, you know, culture and, and diversity. You know, and it's interesting, um, just along the, 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 the culture and the individuality that happens in Texas. Um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from East Texas. Uh, I spent some time out in El Paso, so I got that West Texas uh, in my blood. Um, different time zone entirely, um, but it's a completely different environment out there. And then, um, you know, grew up uh, or went to college um, on the other side of Houston. And just thinking about how different, even just being on opposite sides of the city of Houston can be. Um, as far as culture, you know, it's funny. We like to group East Texas all together. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from East Texas. Right. Um, but there's so much diversity that happens even within East Texas. Um, you know, I, 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 we're, we're, we're joking. We're, we're having a lighthearted conversation. Um, but I want to I want to actually tackle a tougher topic. So it, one of the one of the flaws of Texas is um, that there isn't necessarily equal access in uh, distribution of healthcare resources. Um, we have Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the country. Um, we have amazing medical schools um, and new ones popping up all the time. We have a um, school that you were once affili recently affiliated with, um, uh, Dr. Romero, um, with UT Rio Grande. We have University of Houston popping up. Um, but unfortunately, we have so many health disparities that exist within our state. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go to you first, uh, Dr. Romero, and then you, Dr. Cruz. Can you talk about how those health disparities, those health in inequities impacted you in the care that you were able to provide for patients or maybe how it limited your ability to provide care for patients? Yeah, you know, that's a really important topic. And part of the reason that for me, going to the Rio Grande Valley was a really, really like a dream job was because it aligns with my mission to serve medically underserved communities, to serve diverse communities, to serve um, people who really don't have access to, um, to healthcare, sort of just to healthcare in general, but also um, to specialists. I was actually one of um, a few uh, sort of first set of specialists that came down to that region. Um, and so I really wanted to, to sort of uh, be able to do that. And, and, and thankfully that's something that I feel I'm still able to do here in in New York and my uh, in my practice uh, in Brooklyn, which is also a very diverse community. But in the Valley, you know, unfortunately, I saw a lot of patients who were uninsured. The Rio Grande Valley is one of the communities in Texas, one of the regions that is actually uh, the uh, most poor, um, has really limited resources. And when we say resources, it, it can be something as basic as having internet access at home. Uh, it's about 60% of the community that actually has internet access at home. And you can think about with COVID, right? How much of an impact that could have on um, schooling, for example, and having access to um, the ongoing virtual education, right? That all our kids had to switch to. There's also a big disparities in terms of education and high school graduation rates, uh, the number of people who are uninsured. What this translates to, you know, in practice is actually having a lot of patients whose 
um, care was really fragmented, whose um, operations were paid out of pocket, uh, whose families really had to, you know, I, I had patients um, sell their cars uh, in order to be able to pay for a cancer operation. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, it also translates into incomplete treatment. And so when you're talking about choosing the um, best available treatment, but knowing that that patient may not be able to complete the um, chemotherapy that is necessary, or they may not be able to complete the sessions of radiation therapy, it really does um, start to add up. There are a lot of programs that really were made to help all of these patients try to meet um, the financial need and, and certainly a lot of charity programs. Uh, but, you know, it's really unfortunate that our, um, you know, that our system has not really afforded those patients an opportunity to even be able to establish access to primary care. So it was really heartbreaking, um, certainly something that um, really affected uh, my clinical practice, um, but something that I always try to work with patients to be able to help them, you know, stay on top of it and, and get them to the care that they needed. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Dr. Romero. Uh, Dr. Cruz, similar question. Um, what are your thoughts about the disparities and doesn't necessarily have to focus on healthcare, but just in general, um, the inequities that happen within within the state of Texas and how that may uh, impact uh, the patients that come into your office. So, I, I can tell you that um, I can tell you that from a a a, a social standpoint in. Texas, when I was a medical student, one of the things that I saw is that, you know, regardless of where you were, you still have these small pockets of communities in which um, patients were not only uninsured, but were afraid to seek medical services because of very aggressive immigration policies. And part of one of the things that I did as a medical student was you tried to mobilize not only medical students, but physicians and residents to take care of these populations. And I think that now with the even and even much more so aggressive immigration stand by the current presidential administration, I think that that has, um, a, I, I imagine that that has impacted the health of, of, of our communities in a much worse uh, way. Uh, one of the things that I can tell you is you, I, I was very shocked by the fact that many people out there, regardless, you know, we tend to think about a undocumented. And the first thing that comes to my to our mind is like Mexican, South American. But we tend to forget that there's a whole um, di diversity when it comes to people being undocumented. And you see that in, in, in the larger communities that you go. Like when I was in Fort Worth, we, we had a a very diverse, undocumented community there, and 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 it, and it was it was very disheartening to see that many of these people had um, very um, very easily managed comorbidities that got out of hand, like diabetes, like high blood pressure, that led to really bad outcomes just because they couldn't see a pay, they couldn't see a physician because they were afraid to seek out help. Yeah, and so and so. That that has always been one of the one of the um, most disheartening things that I that I have seen, and and it's really impacted the way that I view my job as a physician moving forward. Because I I feel that my job is to um, provide care for patients, but also um, give more in in regards to volunteering be, because. Providing care to patients and, and, and working is completely different than being altruistic and providing of your time to go to these private private clinics, to go to these, um, you know, um, community-based um, resources that are available to, to, to patients who don't have the resources, who um, might be undocumented, who might just be uninsured. And, and, and to me, um, you know, that's the reason why I decided to pursue medicine for the opportunity to to give back, but at the same time, you know, it is uh, from a socioeconomic standpoint, it 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 puts you to uh, really examine the fact that many of these 
very manageable comorbidities can have long-standing consequences and um it's it's something that we see on on all of our patients and 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 i want to say first just thank you um for the two of you for sharing your thoughts one of the things that i just want to highlight is um part not all but part of the reason um that um uh, our fellow Texans are in the position that they are is because of some of the decisions that leaders have made within the state regarding the expansion of, of, of Medicaid uh, and the adoption of some of the policies that came out of the Affordable Care Act. I'm not trying to get pol uh, political here. Uh, I just want to say that there are ramifications for the decisions that leadership makes when it comes to health and wellness of uh, the state of Texas. And so as you think about who are our leaders, think about the decisions they're making and how that may impact you um, your family members, uh, the people that you love, the people uh, that are in your community. Um, so, uh, all right, let's 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 pivot a, another question. So, a lot of us have ties to Texas from either uh, our college uh, experiences or from our um, high school experiences. And you know, we're all here. The students that are joining us here uh, are here because they want to become uh, physicians. And so. What were some of the things that you found most beneficial along the way, understanding that we are here dealing with a COVID pandemic and maybe the opportunities that we had as pre-meds or high school students may not have been available, may not be currently available to students. But, um, you know, as you think, Brandon, uh, what was a influential experience that you had as a uh, either high school student or pre-med um, to get you in a position to be the best applicant for medical school? Um, <clears throat> the one that I have to go to is, um, becoming a member of the, uh, the SNMA, uh, Student National Medical Association. Um, that to me was, was the absolute game changer. Um, I joined, uh, the SNMA in 2004 and prior to then, um, I had no clue of really anything, right? I didn't even know that people who look like me even were in medicine. I never had a doctor, never had nothing like that. People in my family didn't do this. People in my family didn't go to college. So I didn't know any of this. And one day when my advisor was like, hey, we're going to this conference uh, for the Student National Medical Association, do you wanna go? Sure, okay, right? It was, it was in New Orleans and it was, uh, you know, that's where my family's from. So I was like, yeah, I'm all in. And when I tell you the first day that I got there and saw black and brown people who look like me, who talk like me, who came from backgrounds like me, um, who understood me in a sense, and, and seeing that these were the smartest of the smart people and people dressed up from head to toe and, and uh, there's, there's doctors, there's medical students, there's people who are in my same position that it was life changing for me. And, and literally that first, maybe the first two days of my first conference, I just sat in the lobby of the of the hotel and I didn't really say anything. I just watched. I just took it all in because I was literally amazed at what I was seeing because, you know, coming from LA, I'm not used to seeing black and brown together in that kind of an atmosphere. And it's cool. You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm used to seeing it on a whole nother different perspective. And so for me, it was like, wow, like I didn't know that we could all be in this thousands, right? I'm talking like 2000 people be under one roof and it ain't no problems. Like I was, <laughs> I was like stunned, but it, it made it such a huge impression on me. And um, that to me, when I got back to under, to school after that conference, uh, it changed everything. I went and did a summer program the following summer. And then all of a sudden everything just rolled. And, and the networks that I got from the SNMA, the, the mentors that I got from the SNMA, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. And, and, you know, seeing Dr. Landry and Dr. Matthews when I was a pre-med and seeing them in leadership and remembering them when I was at that New Orleans conference or, and, you know, remembering them from the St. Louis conference and, and, and from, you know, Atlanta conference in 06, like it's, it was just incredible. So SMA was by far the biggest thing for me. I think what you're trying to do right there, Brandon, is make me look old, but I'm going to, I'm going to move on past that. Uh, we're I mean, you know, on. I mean, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Uh, or, or it makes me look like I didn't know what I was doing, and <laughs> and I was struggling because we the same age, <laughs> years ahead of me. So, eh, you can take it how you want to. <laughs> but I'm glad you found the light. SNMA, amazing organization, uh, organization, 
uh, the Latino Medical Student Organization, also an amazing organization. I know, uh, Dr. Romero, you have lots of ties to that organization. Uh, I, you can maybe plug the uh, LMSA National Conference. I'm not sure what they're doing this year, um, but SNMA National Conference is always Easter weekend. Um, I believe they're planning on hosting it either virtually or in person. If it is in person, it'll be in Orlando, Florida, uh, this upcoming Easter weekend. If it's virtual, um, well, you'll be able to log on from wherever you are and be a part of that experience. Um, but I do want to go to you, Dr. Uh, Romero. Um, meaningful, impactful, life-changing experience that you had either in high school or college that put you in the trajectory of where you are today? So as a high school student, I wasn't entirely like tied to a career uh, in medicine. So um, I would say just get good grades, you know, know that you're college bound and, and, and then actually follow through with all of the college prep things, right? And it's okay to not know um, at that stage. Um, if I had had it, um, you know, in high school, I wanted to study dance when I got to college. So, um, so I think, you know, don't feel pressured to be like, oh, I knew, you know, at that time, I actually didn't know in high school um, that medicine was gonna be where I would end up. Once I started exploring careers, I did, um, you know, when I started thinking about healthcare, I did a program that a lot of us are um, actually have uh, our alumni uh, of this program. Back then it was called MMEP. I think now um, it's gone through several name changes. And, and I actually, the last name I uh, had was SMDEP. It is now Summer Health Professions Education Program, SHPEP. Right. Okay, so, so in any case, you know, that, that program actually kind of gave me a little bit of a, of a roadmap, so to speak. I went to um, a school that didn't have an affiliated medical school, and so I thought that program was tremendous in helping me really think about the things that I needed to do to prepare in a way that, um, you know, that those resources are more readily available at an institution that has its own medical school. Um, and then, you know, once I got to medical school, you know, I also saw a lot of value in finding that community of students who understood the challenges that I faced, who uh, were my peers, who had the same kind of goals in healthcare. And so I also, uh, join an organization called Latino Medical Student Association, and it was really a, a, a tremendous source of support, which is something that is really necessary and essential uh, to help you succeed and not feel isolated in school. Um, and since I was given the opportunity, I am going to plug that LMSA is hosting a virtual conference for 2021. If you go to lmsa.net, you can find all of the information, but I know that they have a um, registration. If you register um, by mid-December for pre-meds, uh, that's only $10 to attend the entire program. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, another just shameless plug for SHPEP, Summer Health Professions Education Program. Actually, the applications uh, are live. You can apply to participate in the program. It's open to um, college freshmen and sophomores. Um, it is an amazing life-changing experience. It is a phenomenal opportunity. Um, it's a way for you to get exposure. There's 12 sites all across the country um, that you can go and participate. One of which is at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. So if you want to stay close to home, you should definitely apply to that program. But there's opportunities all across the country. There's a couple in California, New York, uh, Alabama, Louisville, um, Nebraska, Florida. Um, Game-changing, life-altering experience. Um, many of us would not be in the position we uh, are in if it wasn't for the, that amazing program. Uh, Dr. Cruz, similar question. What is that sort of game-changing moment experience that you had as a, as a, as a high school student or a pre-med that puts you in a position to be successful? I think that for me, it was uh, finding a mentor and, and finding, finding a person that would provide me with guidance. Um, I, unlike the majority of my peers, I did not follow the traditional med school route, which is, you know, four years of undergrad followed by uh, four years of um, medical school. I took a very uh, non-traditional route, which was after graduation, 
I went back home, was a, te- was a high school teacher for, for four and a half years. I worked on my MPH. And in the meantime, uh, kind of used that time to, to think about what I wanted to do with my life um, professionally. Um, I wasn't from, <clears throat> when I went through um, undergraduate, um, I felt that medical school or that the that, that medical school was unattainable just because of uh, what I had heard and not from, from what I had heard from knowledgeable people, but from what I had heard from my peers. And so uh, I, I, everybody said, when you talk to your peers, it's, it's, it's what they say is one thing and the, the reality of the situation is another. And so my peers um, were, um, talking to them was very discouraging. I, th- I felt that I needed to, I felt that I had messed up earlier in my undergraduate career and I felt that med- medical school was unattainable. And when, I'm, when I uh, had the opportunity to meet a mentor, to find a mentor, to, to say, hey, you know, everything's possible. You just need to buckle up and this is what you need to do and got me along the right path. I felt that that was very, very eye-opening to me and, 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 and much more so when, when I was in medical school, um, meeting other um, similar medical students who were in the same situation that I was through like what um, Dr. Romero said, being involved in LMSA, being inv- having friends with SNMA, kind of having common goals and, and, and meeting people who, um, I, I know this will be sound a little cliche, but who've had similar struggles. I, I felt that that was like a very, um, very good safety network and very good safety net to have, you know, even in medical school. So, I mean, to me, what made the most, um, what, what the most important experience as a pre-medical student would be to have found a really good mentor who provided me with awesome advice. Yep, yep, thank you for that. I think, you know, we could talk, we could have a whole special session on just the importance of mentoring. Um, and I, I just, I thank you for sharing that because none of us would be here if it wasn't for those mentors who have paved the way for us, who pulled us along, gotten us straight, pulled us by, you know, our, our pulled us by the ear, our shirt collar to get us to act right. But then also been that that voice um, of reason when we were ready to give up. Um, so I think we're all in that space. Maybe maybe I'll go to both um, Dr. Romero to talk about uh, a mentor, and then uh, Dr. Henry to talk about the opposite of a mentor, a gatekeeper. Um, and who was that? So how did you overcome those naysayers? Um, because I know that. Um, Dr. Henry, you mentioned um, that you're, you're first generation to go to medical school, first generation uh, to be in this position that you're in now. Um, it wasn't necessarily commonplace for people to be uh, from where you're from to go into a career in the health professions. Um, and so how did you overcome those gatekeepers in, along the way, whether it's a high school advisor, college advisor, um, to, to, to be successful? Yeah, so, you know, the tough part about Uh, like you said, growing up was just the fact like in high school, um, I was never told that I was uh, smart, right? I I was told, I was told that I was smart on the field, right? I was, I was smart as an athlete, right? I was, I was great at at doing that. Um, But I was never, I was never challenged in, in, in high school. I was never pushed to be academically good. I, I never, I never even read a book in high school. Um, I, but I didn't have to because, again, you have people who just told you you're an athlete. Um, and that's what I thought. And that's what I that's what I went into college just thinking. Um, and honestly, it kind of plagued me for the first. I mean, what it took me, what, seven years to do undergrad. And I think for the first four years, I think that idea of just of being told in high school that you're just an athlete. Um, really kind of uh, messed with me because anytime I would mess up, it was easy, right? I could just say, well, I'm really, I'm just an athlete. Um, and I only came to college to play football. So, uh, you know, if I don't do well in this class, whatever. Um, but being a part of a program that was at, a, at my undergrad called Science Educational Equity, um, it was a program that was really set up for students of color that were interested in going into um, fields of professional fields, right? Whether it was medicine, dentistry, research, whatever, whatnot, and having um, advisors in there who would not let me believe that I was just an athlete, right? Having uh, advisors in there who told me um, 
you will. And, and if I did mess up, having advisors pull me into a room, close the door and say, uh, Brandon, what are you doing? Because it's been four years and you have yet to take a science class. So what are we doing? You know, you're playing if you really want to do this. So to have those who loved me enough to challenge me, but yet give me the love that I needed and the encouragement that I needed. And then to be around students of color who, who again, came from similar backgrounds and who were going to medical school and doing the things that I wanted to do. Um, that was how I got over. But I, I, but I also needed those failures, right? I needed to be put out of school twice uh, for my grades in order for me to understand that I was slipping. Um, it, it, was, it was the hurdles and obstacles that, that did it as well. Um, but I, you have to have, you gotta have good folks around you because if not, you know, it's, it's rough. Uh, Dr. Dr. Romero, talk about how you have been um, aided in success uh, with the help of strong mentorship. Yeah, so let me just um, take a second to say to Dr. Henry, you are smart, you are <laughs> special. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Um, you know, but, but I think it's really important because um, we don't hear that. And the truth is we don't. And I think, you know, sometimes it can be um, ignorant. Sometimes it can be um, people trying to keep you from getting hurt or, you know, or, or, or keep you from experiencing failure. And so even though, you know, maybe they're well intended, it really doesn't help, right? Um, I'll, you know, what I always tell people about mentorship is that you have to find good mentors, regardless of where you're at. I have a tremendous, uh, mentor that I didn't meet until a lot later, right? It, in, in, in residency, I didn't have any women mentors. I pretty much still haven't really had like a Latina mentor. Um, I, so it, so, so I've had to look for mentorship in, in people who, you know, who don't look like me, who, you know, who are mostly men and, and they've been great. Right. And so, um, so, so I say that just because I think when people really are looking out for your best interests, um, they will do, you know, what you need them to do and, and they will get you to where you need to be and they will help you sort of plot that out. Um, now, in terms of, you know, who are some of the people that, that were influential and helped me, you know, I, I, like, I like to share a story, which is, you know, one of my, um, one of the people who open doors for me, um, often, very often gives, gives the advice, which is to grow where you're planted. And, you know, and, and I take that um, to really mean, you know, you have to find a way to thrive, right? You have to be that rose that grew from concrete. You have to really find a way um, out of all of the hardship and all of the struggles. Um, and, and I really appreciate it uh, because that um, as I um, left that institution where this mentor was, um, one of the gifts that I received was a, uh, a door stopper. And it's a, it's a high heel shaped door stopper. Um, you know, and the message to me with that was just, I really, you know, all that person did was help me get my foot in the door and I did the rest of the work to kick the door open. Right. And so the reminder for the door stopper is really to just, um, remember that sometimes all, all I need to do in the future is to let someone in, but really the majority of the work comes from, from within ourselves. Thank you um, for sharing that, uh, Dr. Romero. And I guess the Texas spin on, on you know, the rose that grew from the concrete is um, even a cactus blooms flowers, right? And so we can be from the harshest environments and still bloom and still be beautiful. Um, and I think that's just where it's at. You know, you have to remember that despite the, the, the space that you're in, whether you're in that high school where the majority of the kids are on free lunch or you're considered... Uh, to be in that inner city school that nobody is going to be successful from. You can be successful. Uh, and I think that you have to carry that with you uh, along the way. Um, find the support and the mentors that you need. If the mentors aren't there at your high school or your college, uh, find them elsewhere. One of the things that we pride ourselves on with the Tour for Diversity in Medicine 
is the fact that we mentor so many students along the way. And we're always talking about our W's, our successes. When we have a student who we started, who we met on the tour at an early stage in their career and helped to bring them along to help them to get into medical school. And we're seeing them go into residency now. And so reach out to folks like us at the Tour for Diversity in Medicine because we're here to help y'all. Um, so just remember where, where that, that, that we're here. Um, I wanna go just quickly, Brandon, what's the one thing that shocked you about Texas? For me, um, it is the fact that it is so hot, right? And I'm from Texas, but just like the fact you'd walk outside and you just start sweating and you'd have to have a different shirt from where you were going. Uh, so Brandon, what's, what's the one thing that shocked you about being in Texas? Man, let me tell you, that hurt. You had to talk about that heat. And when I tell you in Central Texas and Wac and Waco, that, bro, it, it hurt so bad. And I just, I, I felt like I couldn't hide from the sun. I thought the sun was indoors with me. Like it was, and I felt like I kept running and it didn't matter what I did. The sun was right there. Uh, but the thing I think that was most surprising, because, you know, okay, being, a, being a, an adopted son of Texas, when you come from California, right, there's this thought of what Texas is. Um, and what people are like in Texas. And what I found to be, what was surprising me is just how dope Texas is and how dope the people are in Texas, right? Like you, 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 really, you really get this thought of everybody there is, is just kind of one way, right? Everybody's one-sided. And when I got there, I really recognized that people are just good people, right? I mean, it's like people were actually, again, very friendly. Um, there's a big sense of, of community there's a big sense of, of, of family. There's a big sense of, hey, whatever you need, hey, you know, and, and um, there's this idea of um, almost like a we at times, you know what I mean? And, and when you're there, and even if you're a transplant, when they notice that they know that you're a transplant, they still take you as, come on, right? Let's, let's go, let's, let's, let's get it going. And, and it's, so it really, um, and it actually surprised me how much I enjoyed the roadie and my cowboy boots too. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Dr. Cruz, similar question. Shocking. What was it? What was that? You know, what's what's so different about Texas compared to uh, to, to other places? Just, I mean, I have to I have to say, you know, aside from you know the the fact that it's so huge and the food. The other great thing is, you know, the people, I think that, that the people make Texas what Texas is, you know, no, like, like Brandon said, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're a Texan, you're a Texan first and foremost, but I, I feel that, you know, just the people are unlike some of the people that I've met in other parts of the country. Um, they're, they're welcoming. Um, they're, they, they're willing, even as a, um, from wherever you're from, they're willing to take you as a as a um, they're willing to take you as part of their family, and 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 the fact that there's just so much diversity in Texas that there's um, so many um, people that that are willing to just take you in and 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 make you part of their family is is it's unlike anything that I've seen you know being in Oklahoma being in in Louisiana being being in in the northeast i mean people here are are truly unique, genuinely uh friendly and th that is something that 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 i cannot say is this is true about other places and the word here the operative word being genuine i think that that people really are genuine here in texas all right dr romero different question for you what is it, you know, you're now, you're now in New York. Is there something that you took from Texas um, that you said, you know what, while I'm here, I need this piece of Texas with me at all times? You know, I'd like to say I took some of the Texas draw. I definitely still include the y'all in all my emails. <laughs> y'all nodding, because you know I say, you know, I put that in all my messaging. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I really think the... Um, the, 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 the sort of Southern politeness that, um, that we often stereotypically say is absent in the Northeast. And that's something that, that I think really um, has made some of the things in this transition easier for me. I'll tell you this, the one thing that from Texas that I've taken up to Boston, um, in addition to barbecue, um, is my Juneteenth celebration. Um, so, um, every Juneteenth that weekend, 
where it's a throwdown at the Landry household, where um, I make sure that everybody gets um, both a historical lesson as we talk about the significance of Juneteenth uh, to the state of Texas, uh, to the freed um, uh, individuals, um, and then also how that is just such a big part of our culture in Texas. So uh, Juneteenth, uh, if you're in Boston, you're a Texan and you're looking for a nice hot plate of barbecue, um, you know, hit me up and I'll make sure that you're well fed. All right. You no, know, Alden, uh, I went to school in Texas and I didn't realize that other states didn't teach kids about it. And so I grew up knowing all about it and I didn't realize that it wasn't included in other um, history books. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we, we skate around that topic, but um, you know, as a Texan, I take that with me. So um, yeah, you're right. We know about this, but not everybody else does. All right, so we're nearing the end of our time. And I wanna just, again, say thank you to um, my panelists for joining us. Thank you um, for hosting us. This has been a great experience and just being a part of this conversation um, and just an opportunity for us to talk. Um, so maybe as we're wrapping up, um, as we're finishing up with maybe um, three or four minutes to spare, um, I want to go just, we'll go in order of, of my screen uh, counterclockwise with Dr. Henry, Dr. Cruz, and then Dr. Romero, you know, is there one sort of sage piece of advice that you got along the way um, that was really helpful? We talked about mentors, we talked about summer programs, we talked about how amazing Texas is, but, you know, when you were in that dark time, was there something that was said to you that helped you carry on and move forward? Um. I was built for this. I was made for this. So the fight that it that it takes to get to where you got to get to, and and when you're in those those dark places and in and in those valleys, um, you were made for this, and uh, you will get through this, um, just like every single all four of us on here have. Um, it's in you, right? It's just a matter of just pulling it out, and sometimes that's the hardest thing, but it's there. Um, you were built for this. So keep your head up, keep fighting, keep pushing, keep scratching, keep clawing and keep digging. And uh, don't accept no for an answer and get what you got coming to you, get what's yours. Dr. Cruz, uh, any sage piece of advice? So I got to, um, first is like, like Brandon said, I, I was told never to give up. If, if, if this is, you know, we'll face many obstacles along the way, along our professional careers. But if this is something that you truly want, just keep on working hard for it. And, and, and as long as, as your heart is in the right place, it'll eventually come to you. Try, work your hardest, know what you need to change. And, and, and if, if, if it's there for you, it's going to be there for you. Um, so um, that's one thing. And then the other, the other piece of advice would be, Wherever you're at, try to find family. And by trying to find family, I uh, one of the things is try to find people who who are like are like you, who think like you. Try to find that support system. That to me has been kind of the the shoulder to lie on when when I feel that I am in need of emotional support. I think that that is one of the things that we take for granted. That, that we will face those hard times and, and that we have to have our support system to be there to, to give us a pep talk, to tell us to keep, to, to you know, raise us, to, to kind of tell us to, to raise and to raise our heads up when, when we feel like crying, when, when we feel like giving up, we need that support system and we need to find family and, and family will sometimes not look like us you know, but the family is what's inside their heart. And so find those people, find the people who will be there for you and, and never give up on them and never give up on yourself. Dr. Romero. So I, I shared a little bit of that advice, you know, grow where you're planted. Um, I would say along the same lines, you know, yes, you can do it. And, and I think that's a really important piece of it. Um, uh, and then the last thing I'll say is measure twice, cut once. Like it. Um, you know, I got a couple of great pieces of advice along the way. Um, and I try and share this. One of the things that actually came out of the tour, um, which I'll credit for, uh, to Dr. Um, uh, Justice Stringfellow is you have a story and it's a mantra that we've taken on as a part of the, 
uh, the tour for diversity. Um, and it's your job to share your story, right? And so we all have um, uh, amazing stories, share your story. And then also just similar to what everyone is saying, never settle. Um, if you all um, want to be uh, a physician, you wanna be like uh, Dr. Romero or Dr. Cruz, or you wanna be a sports doc like Dr. Henry, um, never settle. That means you put forth the effort, the time, the commitment uh, to get to where you're at. Um, delayed gratification is a huge piece of medicine and we didn't even touch on that. Um, but you're not gonna reap the same benefits coming out of high school, college, um, and then going into a job like many of your friends will do. Um, but if you are dedicated to a career in medicine and you're gonna be in a position like Dr. Henry who had took multiple gap years, Dr. Cruz who took multiple gap years, um, but ultimately came out on the back end to be physicians and be successful, um, and now they're living their dream, they had to experience delayed gratification. Uh, and that's just a part of medicine and it's where we are, uh, where we are as a profession. Um, I wanna check in with our host uh, and see where we're at with time. Uh, Enrique, uh, thank you for allowing us the space uh, to represent Texas so much, to represent Tour for Diversity in Medicine so much. Um, and uh, you know, it's just a pleasure to be here and, and have this conversation over the past hour. Likewise, Dr. Landry, Dr. Romero Arenas, Dr. Cruz, and Dr. Henry, thank you all so much for these great insights. Uh, I've been writing notes feverishly in the background, just making sure that we cover all of this. And there are just so many great uh, pieces of uh, encouragement that you've offered all of our students. And I think that's really uh, the key here is that there are people out there who are willing to help. So we have shared links for you to get in touch uh, with the mentors here and the mentors that we had yesterday and other mentors through Tour for Diversity. Uh, and we've shared several uh, pieces of contact information for you to follow up because uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you get out of it what you put in. So on behalf of the Texas Health Education Service, TMDSAS, the Joint Admission Medical Program, and of course, Tour for Diversity in Medicine are amazing, amazing guests. We'd like to wish each of you all the best of luck. Uh, keep at it, it's gonna be worth it. So thank you all so much and we'll talk to you later. TV.